And the balance sheet is how you actually funded the company. And we generally use, we, we would classify companies into two categories. Some are asset light, some are asset heavy. I mean, an asset light business would be, for instance, a company like a consulting firm. The assets of the consulting firm are people. They don't show up on the balance sheet, right? The assets of a cement factory are actually the property plan and equipment. So you would see much heavier investment in assets in a, call it a sort of industrial type business than you would in maybe a services type business. But there are two types of balance sheets, uh, for, uh, two types of companies from that regard. And then when you, when you talk about the assets of the business, so fine, you're investing in building up the assets of a business. How did you finance those assets? Did you finance with your debt? Or did you finance with your equity? And so this is where the balance sheet is important, and we'll go, again get back to some key ratios that we would use in terms of analyzing that. The cash flow statement actually, arguably, potentially the most important of them. Because again, revenue and your income statement doesn't mean cash. The, the cash generation of a business as opposed to just this uh, revenue and, and net income becomes very important. So if I can just uh, jump to the next slide. I mean, if we talk about the ratios then, if we sort of in integrate this and take it a step further, fine, we've talked about the three financial statements and what they do and what they mean. Um, how would an investor start approaching that at a basic level? Well, you would start thinking about, okay, um, what is my gross margin in a business when I take a look at my income statement? What is my fixed cost versus my variable cost? And how is that margin changing over time? Am I getting more leverage in the business? As the sales grow, do my profits increase at a faster rate, right? So these are the types of things that when we look at the financial statements that an investor would look at. From a balance sheet perspective, to increase my sales, how much investment do I need? How much more do I have to invest in my property, plan, equipment? How much, uh, how much more do I need to invest in my working capital, right? Because if you're, if you're, if you're a business and you sell but you don't collect your receivables on that sale for 90 days, then you have a pretty, um, pretty high working capital cycle that will impact the growth of your business. And that sort of leads to the third part. I mean, um, when, we, when we look across the statements and we look at the, the quality of earnings and we look at the sort of sustainability of a business model, again, it, it's important to understand that there's some businesses that can grow very fast, but they may actually end up going bankrupt before they know it in that growth because they're ending up getting into a situation where they are paying out their expenses much faster than they're collecting their receivables. So um, it's, we call that a working capital cycle trap. And it's, again, it comes out when you start analyzing the financial statements in, in detail. And so these are the, really the, the, the basics of it. But one, one point I want to get across here is that it's not the earnings that are important, it's the quality of the earnings. And what that means is there's a lot of accounting um, accounting standards that are applied for any, when you put together these financial statements. Generally, generally, those standards would be consistent across an industry, but there's always room to um, manipulate those standards to some degree or use different standards or play on those standards a little bit. And it's important that as someone reading financial statements that you're able to, to take a look at that and say, are they being conservative in the way that they recognize the revenue? Or are they being very aggressive in the way that they recognize the revenue? Are they being conservative in the way they recognize the expenses? Or are they being, being very aggressive from that perspective? So there's that level of detail that comes in. And you know, this is the underlying background for a lot of the future uh, additional conversation we'll have. Um, but we're gonna jump topics now, actually, to talk about um, one of the reasons we're here, which is some of you have companies, some of you are looking for capital, and we wanna talk about um, raising capital and what that means from a private equity venture capital perspective. And to do that, uh, probably one of the basic models and the way to do that, to look at that is to take a look at the company life cycle, what this graph shows. And really what it does is it breaks down a company into four distinct um, periods of its, of its evolution. The development, growth, maturity, and decline. Um, and the way that we look at it as investors, actually from our perspective, because um, as I mentioned, we are an investor for small medium enterprises and and we come across a, a lot of situations where you have to actually have a good understanding of where the company plays on this, uh, plays on this graph. I mean, is the company here? Is it, is it at the stage where it's the, the risk is the business model risk? Meaning that, and what we mean by this is, they have some revenue, fine, but they haven't really fully proven their business in, the, um, in, in, a, in a broader context, right? And so there's still a sort of a developmental state, more of a, 
more of a sort of exper uh, experimental and high growth stage versus once they prove that model and once they have a, some traction in terms of the revenue, we call that being at the execution stage, right? Because then the sort of risk shifts. Okay, fine, there's a need for their product or service in the market, but now somebody has to deliver that. And then it becomes an execution, um, an execution type risk and the ability to really scale up a business and grow a business and be able to do that on a larger scale. Those are, uh, and the important thing is, too, um, the risks are, are significantly different. So you would actually price an opportunity um, depends very much on where you see a business along those two dimensions. And, and, it, and it becomes very much subjective uh, a lot of the time. So uh, Farhan, if we can uh, move forward. I want to talk a little bit about the types of equity. So if, uh, so if you're a company and you're out there um, and you're looking for different types of financing, there's multiple types when we talk about equity, and right now, we'll keep it to equity. There's two types of financing that you can raise, debt and equity. Right now, let's keep the conversation more to equity, and we'll touch on the debt component in a little while. But on the equity side, you can actually break it down into two types of equity. One that we would call um, network-driven equity, and the other which we would call institutional-driven. And then, so what do we mean by those? Well, on the network-driven side, um, the, the immediate ones that come to mind are whether you have personal money yourself or you have family and friends that have money that can support your business venture. Unfortunately, that's how a lot of the businesses in this region end up getting funded because there's a lack of finance available on the institutional side. So really it's the people who have access to these family and friend networks that can find the capital to support their businesses, which is unfortunate. But um, in any case, I mean, even in developed markets like the U.S., I mean, it becomes a very important source of financing, right? And generally, for any business that starts out, it's going to initially start from the founder's own pocket, and he's going to reach out to his immediate friends and family to help fund the business. As it gains some scale, at least in more developed markets, you have what we call uh, angel investors and angel capital. Angel capital is... A, is is, you know, it's in a network-driven category. It could either be an institutional or a network. It's a little bit of a bridge in between, but this, these are people who are generally successful business people, the business people themselves, who have an interest in investing in business opportunities and staying close to the market in that perspective, and who generally take small, I mean, they, they would generally take smaller investment sizes. They, they wouldn't invest one or two million, per se. They may invest 50, $100,000, and they generally form a community in any, in any sort of geographic area. And they, there may be an angel, like in, in Silicon Valley, there's an angel network, right? And so before actually having to go out to the, to the more institutional venture capital community, entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley can go out, reach out to an angel network, right? It's actually one of the things that's missing in this part of the world, and is, uh, you could argue, badly needed, because it's a very important source of financing. I mean, everyone sort of talks about you know, venture capital, um, immediately, but um, you know, in, in the U.S., the angel community is three times the size of the venture community, so it's an important uh, source of financing. Once you move past the angels, you start getting into the capital where, uh, into the type of capital where Abraj and Riyadh Enterprise Development play, which is the institutional capital and the, and we'll, you know, we'll start off with venture. But venture, if you remember the graph before, when we're talking about the companies that were at that early stage where the business model wasn't fully defined and where they were at that stage and they had that risk uh, profile associated with it, those are companies that would fall under that category. And venture capital firms would generally, you know, they, they operate on a model where they will take, they will make 10 investments and they want one or two to hit it big and the others they're, they're, they're sort of less worried about. They take a more of a portfolio approach or high risk investors in that perspective. Then you get to the growth capital, um, where again, this is more the execution, execution phase type risk. And this will find more prevalent in the region. This is definitely one of the areas that Riyadh Enterprise Development, our fund, focuses on, so we can talk about that more in the Q&A session. And then you get private equity, which is um, the core business within a broad, which is generally focusing on large transactions. These are more mature companies where somebody's growing a company to a certain stage, and now they're actually looking to cash out of the business. Um, I want to spend a few minutes talking specifically on the private equity, and you know, here I'll grow, uh, uh, I will rope in growth capital and private equity into the same, into the, into the same topic here because it, they operate very similarly. Now, what are the key features of private equity? Well, first of all, it's permanent capital. 
into, it's, it's not a loan that has to be made after five years. It's a permanent investment, right? So it, 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 it's very much, it helps improve the, the health of a balance sheet tremendously and, and provide the entrepreneur and the business owner with patient capital so that he can grow his business over the long term. And what, and what, did, what did the investors receive in exchange for providing permanent capital? They receive shares in the company. So if you're the entrepreneur, you're going to, uh, you, you're going to have to be in that situation where you're willing to provide the investor with shares in your company. And a lot of people in this region, um, for them, that's something new because whether they're family-owned businesses or whether they're businesses that just haven't been approached by private equity investors in the past, the concept of giving equity into their business, of giving someone else a board seat in their business, of letting out someone else look at the numbers in their business on a quarterly basis is, is foreign to them, right? Um, they're, they're, that mindset's increasingly changing. Um, there have been a lot of successful examples through, um, uh, through successful private equity investments that have pique people's interest in this. So you, you're seeing a change in mentality there, but it, it still exists. Um, and it's important to note that, I mean, in terms of rights, when, when investors come in, when private equity investors come in, whether they're minority, especially in the case when they're a minority investor, they're going to demand certain rights to protect themselves as a minority investor. So that means that if you're generally, the, if you're the business owner and you've owned 100% of the business and you've been running the business how you've seen fit, you've been taking money out of the business to pay your kids school fees or whatever, that's okay when you own 100% of the business. But when somebody else owns 30% of the business, it's not just okay to treat the, um, the cash account like your piggy bank. And so there's certain rights that then get conferred onto the business that are there for the investors. So there's a change in approach in terms of the way a business has to be run when, once private equity comes in. And private equity is a very hands-on approach, right? I mean, uh, and, that, and that works in the favor of a lot of these companies who are looking for this capital. They don't generally, they're not willing to give up 30% of their company that they built to someone who's just going to sit there. They want someone who's going to come in and add value, sit on the board, help grow their business, introduce them to contacts in different countries so that they can expand across the region and whatnot. So there, there, there has to be that element of value add, and that's the, generally what can separate a good private equity firm from a bad private equity firm. It's important as business owners to think about what that value is and what that value that the investor is bringing to the table. Um, now, if you go and jump ahead to debt, I mean, I, I, I really didn't want to spend a lot of time on this. We can, you know, open up more for the Q&A, but when you think about is it right for your company, um, I guess the, the key thing here is understanding the nature of the underlying business and your business and the cash flows behind it. If you're generally in an unpredictable business with lumpy cash flows, then you probably don't want to put a lot of debt in your business, right? Not only that, not, you're not going to get much debt because the banks won't lend you. If you have more of an infrastructure type asset which has steady cash flows um, and, 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 and predictable revenue stream and whatnot, then, then, then it's prudent to use debt. We, we, we will tell you that. Um, it, it actually is prudent. I mean, let's face it, debt, the advantages of debt is lower cost. When you're looking for private equity money, private equity capital is generally going to cost you, the return threshold there is in the 30% plus range. The return threshold for debt is in the 10 to 12% range, right? So it's cheaper for debt. Debt is cheaper than equity, but it doesn't make sense for your business. That's the key. And of course, there are different types of debt. And uh, again, this is probably one side that I will skip over. Um, we can talk about this in the Q&A, but do you have senior debt? Do you have unsecured debt? Do you have junior mezzanine debt? There are different types in the the bottom line here is that it can be structured in different ways, the debt. And we'll skip that for now. Um, this slide I'll just spend uh, maybe a minute on, just talking about what banks require when you do provide debt. Um, because again, a lot, of, uh, you know, a, a lot of people immediately think that, um, you know, I'll just go for the debt, it's cheaper, right? Why not? But at the same time, I mean, it, it's going to put a significant burden on the business in terms of personal guarantees and collateral requirements that are going to be going to be required of the proprietor of the business. There's going to be a lot of covenant ratios that you're going to need to maintain, right? You're going to have to have a certain amount of earnings to cover the interest payment and whatnot. And you're going to have a lot of restrictions on the way you run your business as if you had brought in an investor anyway. Um, and that those would include things such as dividend, dividend distribution, um, any, any other sort of uh, strategic changes to the business and whatnot. So it's important to think about when you bring that into a business, you actually have to um, fully understand what that entails for your business. 
And we talked about debt, we talked about equity, but there are actually also other financing options that are, with, are available depending on the business. And again, here the point is to think creatively about your business because as an entrepreneur, as, a, as an owner of a business, you want to maximize um, the return you get for every dollar invested. And that means that um, you can use other tools such as, you know, there, there's some mentioned here, and I'll, I'll pick one like leasing. Um, you know, that's, if, you're, if you're an owner of a business, and let's say you have a, a school business and you, you're operating schools throughout the region, do you need to build every single school that you end up operating? Or can you lease the schools? Can you lease the site from somebody else? Right? Why do you have to put that capital investment up front? Right? Switching your business model like that and significantly reduce the cash requirements for the business and increase the return on equity, right? Because you don't have to invest as much equity, but you can generate still a good return. So you want to think about creative ways, and here are just a few, and um, uh, we can talk about these more later, but think about creative ways to minimize the amount of investment that you need, whether it's in the form of debt or equity, before maybe going out to those options. And uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Farhan.